Spencer? Yes. What's up? Giants, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I just wanted to thank you very much privately. That's all. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks. Bye.
Okay, our speaker has arrived. Um, okay, so Ed, you are now a co-host, so that should enable you to share your screen. Okay. Um, all right. Um, before I introduce our speaker, Ed, I did want to make an announcement about um, um, there's going to be a gap next week. There is no colloquium. Um, and what we'll have in the fourth week is uh, our own uh, Billy Scano will um, give a, a short presentation on some of the things he's implemented for remote teaching. He won a remote teaching award and we want to recognize that. We also wanted to use it as a forum for people to um, talk about what works and doesn't work in, in remote teaching as they as they've been finding. We want to hear from all levels, undergraduates, graduate students, faculty, and I, I'm looking forward to it just to see what people have to say and um, to learn from it. Um, I'll set up a Google survey so that people can submit the you know questions, comments um, anonymously, and that that I'll tell I'll give it to Tiffany and she'll send it out with the colloquium um, advertisement. So then uh, please feel free to you know submit things if you're not willing to say them. You know I'll read them out. If you want to submit them anonymously, um, or if you can't make it. Um, okay. Um, Ed, are you basically ready for me to introduce you? I am. Uh, yes, thank you, Spencer. And I will share my screen, or should I wait until you're done? Uh, I mean, you, they don't need to see me. You can, you can share your screen, just make sure it works. Um, okay. So we actually see your, I don't know if we, we want to show the, pres, I think we see your presenter view, I think. It's a, maybe that's not. Oh, I see. Okay. Apologies. Let me... <laughs> it's okay. Um, okay. So Ed, what, you know, we're really excited to have Ed uh, Birchinger to, you know, tell us about um, the team up report and his work there. And, um, you know, you know, Ed, I, I was very fortunate to have seen Ed. Um, he had given a similar talk at UC Irvine. And so I saw this on Facebook and I watched it and it was, it, you know, I, I really enjoyed the, the presentation. I thought it would be great for us to see it, um, the Oregon version of it. And he will tailor some of it, I believe, to Oregon uh, information. And, um, you know, this is something that the diversity committee has been tasked with kind of to facilitate the, the department to, um, you know, to take the, you know, the TM report and see what we can uh, change in our department. Um, and so it's a very important, uh, you know, endeavor for this, this year, even though, you know, we're all busy with given the pandemic and all the changes, uh, diversity is very, um, you know, it's a priority for our university. And, and so this is, I, you know, I think this is why uh, we should really devote extra time to this, even though time is precious. So let me let me introduce Ed. Um, he so graciously provided an introduction, um, which uh, I'll, I'll just read. So his pronouns are he, him, and his. And he's a professor in physics at MIT, and he's an affiliated faculty in the program in when women's and gender studies at MIT. And uh, his, his physics research background is in theoretical, uh, in theoretical astrophysics, uh, interested in gravitation, cosmology, and numerical methods. And uh, some of his, uh, his recent work has turned towards social sciences. And he's been extremely active in diversity, equity, and inclusion work um, at kind of many levels at MIT and, and nationally, and uh, for instance, the American Astronomical so Society the American Physical Society and the American Institute of Physics. And in this case, the team up report is under the American Institute of Physics. And he also loves mentoring, bird watching, and a good Italian wine. And we're, you know, it's, he's been very gracious with his time. And uh, I think we're all, you know, we already had a diversity committee meeting with him and we really learned a lot. And so I, 
I really feel uh, sad that we could not uh, reward him with some of our local wine. So, um, okay, with that, uh, uh, Ed, will you please take it away? Thank you so much, uh, Spencer. And uh, you know, thanks for the gracious introduction. And you hopefully won't be surprised, but pleased to know that I, I do have some um, Oregon uh, Pinot Noirs and uh, uh, Sauvignon Blancs in my wine cooler. <laughs> uh, so uh, thanks so much for, for the kind introduction and invitation. And although I wish I very much wish I could be with you in person, I really enjoyed my day of discussions with, with several groups and individuals. And I wanna thank you all for that gift. I really liked how the graduate students bookended their hour with provocative questions, and I thought I would emulate them here. So I wondered uh, what thoughtful question might I ask a visitor or a group that could be informative for all of us? And the answer came to me this afternoon I was, as I was reading a blogger I admire. At the end of the talk, I'll share a link to that blog. Uh, for, but for now, I'll simply remark that uh, the question I would ask a visitor is this. What's the most thought-provoking or memorable thing you read today? I'll give you a minute to reflect on this. And if you so choose, I'll post a link where you can anonymously enter an answer to that question in case you'd like to share with colleagues. So let me just see if I can bring up the chat window and uh, do it. <laughs> Some of you may be familiar with Slido. It's one of the uh, wonderful innovations that uh, the pandemic uh, year has brought to us. And I use it in, in teaching and, and workshopping and, and giving uh, colloquia. So if you click on the link I just posted in the chat, it should, I hope, bring up a, uh, a live poll uh, where you can type your anonymously an answer to your question. You can post a link. Uh, it'll, provide a bit of a reading list for us afterwards. And as I said, at the end of this colloquium, I'll, I'll share with you uh, my answer to that question. So you can, if there are down moments when you uh, want to turn to uh, web browsing, you can, <laughs> Go to that link and enter your answer. I'm, I'm going to continue with my, my talk now. We'll see what comes up over time. As I mentioned, um, I really enjoyed my, my discussions with many of you, uh, mainly around your passion for and your commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, they're inspiring. Uh, many of you are already quite familiar with the topic of this colloquium, but I hope to have something for everyone. Uh, I'll be discussing a national effort led by the American Institute of Physics which convened a national task force to elevate African-American representation in undergraduate physics and astronomy, or team up. I was the co-chair of this task force. And in this talk, I'll provide the national context as well as some of the department level context in your department and mine. I'll show this slide again at the end of the talk. These are the primary takeaway messages. There is a persistent problem in physics with underrepresentation of African Americans. The reasons for this have been thoroughly investigated and involve both data and stories. The achievement gaps reside and must be addressed in our institutions. They are not due to defects in students. The team up report identified the causal and curative factors. And finally, Team Up is continuing in a problem solving mode to help interested departments take action to improve their outcomes. Let's begin, as physicists like to do, with some data. These graphs show the percent change in numbers of bachelor's degrees awarded annually by field and by race or ethnicity since 1995, when the US government first began systematic annual data collection. There are many things to notice. First, the black curves show that total bachelor's degrees awarded have more than doubled in physics in the right panel, and also have more than doubled for African Americans across all fields in the left panel. But if we look at the intersection of African Americans in physics, we see a difference. Physics has lagged all major fields except mathematics, and African Americans in physics have shown less increase than all other groups. You'll also notice two distinctive peaks. Computer science shows the technology boom and bust of the internet bubble, 
And Native Americans enrollments and degrees show a boom and bust due to different economic circumstances more recently. Today, we're focusing on African Americans in physics. A physicist might ask whether the underrepresentation of African Americans in physics is merely a national problem arising in a few large producers or is more widespread. Here's data from your own department, or rather from the US Department of Education about your department. I have assembled a complete history of gender and race data and show here more than 50 years for gender and 25 years for race and ethnicity. Due to small numbers, I don't fully disaggregate by race and ethnicity. The URM category is, is almost entirely Hispanic students. It does include one black or African-American student, as you can see that little bump up, up in the bottom uh, purple curve there. According to the IPEDS database, you did have one student who graduated in 2013 who identified as black or African-American. And the URM category also includes a Native American, Native Hawaiian, and of course, Hispanic American or, or Latino. And you, you have had a number, quite a number of uh, Hispanic or Latino students and a few Native Americans. Uh, the dashed curves are national. The solid curves are for your department. So you can uh, look at that and see patterns and some interesting ups and downs with uh, the pattern for, for women. Uh, this is affected a bit by small number statistics. Even with the three-year averaging, the statistical variation in numbers is, is pretty clear. And this is why I'm not disaggregating uh, gender and race. What's the conclusion of this? Well, probably that the University of Oregon shares in the underrepresentation of African American undergraduates in physics, along with the rest of the profession. Now, that conclusion uh, probably isn't surprising to anyone here, given that Oregon ranks 43rd among states in the percentage of its population that is Black or African American at 3%. Incidentally, 3% is also the percentage of all physics bachelor's degrees in the US going to black or African-American students. At the University of Oregon, let's look not just at physics, but all physical sciences and engineering. These data include engineering, which you don't really have, but computer science, math, chemistry, physics, and so on, but exclude biology. On average, black students earn 0.4% of the bachelor's degrees in these fields here. That's twice the 25-year the, uh, average percentage for physics at UO. Well, admittedly, the statistics aren't great there. Uh, but it still indicates overall a, a very small a pool for recruitment at the University of Oregon. And this raises several thoughts. First, imagine how it feels to be one out of 250 or one out of 500. It requires an exceptional person to persevere in those circumstances. Second, all the work in the world to build a great environment will not change the numbers without effective outreach and recruitment activities, which I won't be discussing in this talk. So I'm sorry, one can't solve the problem in, with just one set of activities. You, you can work hard and benefit from it, but it will take more than just the department, climate, and culture to make a difference for African-American enrollments at the University of Oregon. Clearly, the context matters greatly. I'm going to be highlighting uh, data from University of Oregon and from MIT for comparison, so it's important to know how they differ and how they're alike. Oregon is wider. It recruits largely in-state and its students have greater financial need and less family history of attending college. MIT has such a small percentage of students taking federal loans compared with Oregon, not because the students are so much more wealthy, but because MIT is wealthy. The average financial aid MIT provides to its entering students is almost five times that of UL. Also, MIT is much more limited in its choice of majors. It has a strong focus on STEM, especially engineering, math, and the physical sciences. Clearly, when we talk about privilege, there are great inequities across institutions. Seeing these data, I understand the anger many have toward East Coast elites. It bothers me, this great discrepancy, this inequity of resources across institutions. Still, that's the MIT context, so let's look at what money can buy. 
Here are the bachelor's degree trends for MIT physics. The numbers are larger than at UO, so the statistical fluctuations are smaller. What's most notable here are perhaps several longer term features. The step increases for women around 1985 and 2002, and the steady and then accelerating growth in minority, again, mostly Hispanic, but not entirely, students since 2000 until a crash in 2015, and the fits and starts in graduating black students. I've been on the MIT faculty since 1986, so I've been part of this history and I have some understanding of what caused these features. I was involved with several of them and I know the role of department leadership in affecting change. As I said at the beginning, data tell a story. But the purpose of this colloquium is not to tell MIT's story, it's to help you tell your own. As a reminder, here are the data for your uh, department. Now, some of you are probably wondering about similar data for the PhDs. Here they are. The statistical fluctuations year to year are now quite large, but you probably get the message. The percentage of women has increased over 40 years, but otherwise representation lags national averages. It's actually very similar for MIT. Here are the MIT PhD data. After accounting for the smaller statistical fluctuations, a lot of similar features occur. Now there is a difference. There are more underrepresented minorities getting PhDs at MIT, probably because at the graduate level, MIT also has more resources for recruitment. So there could be other reasons, but I know that there's often a resource competition um, and uh, we're not starved for, for resources. So there's an ele another element of, of inequity at play. Uh, but I want to return to the main story, which concerns African-American undergraduates in, in physics. Uh, despite the challenges, I strongly believe it's possible and imperative to make progress uh, in that area and at Oregon and everywhere. Now, the American Institute of Physics is a federation of 10 physics societies, including the American Physical Society and the American Astronomical Society. It convened a study panel in 2018 to investigate the reasons for the persistent underrepresentation of African American undergraduates in physics and to provide recommendations for solving this problem. The task force published its report in January of 2020. Its high level summary is this African American students have the same drive, motivation, intellect, and capability to obtain physics and astronomy degrees as others. They often face more severe financial and cultural barriers than others, which largely explain why physics lags the other areas, other professions. And physics departments can assess and improve their practices to dramatically improve their success. Uh, and in the report, uh, we present a lot of data, of, of course, about and from students, but also from successful departments. And I'll be sharing a lot of that uh, results, research results with you uh, this afternoon. The team of task force was co-chaired by Mary James of Reed College and myself and included these wonderful physicists, social scientists, and administrators. I'm uh, really pleased to note that astrophysicist Judaya Eisler, pictured in the upper right, has joined the Biden transition team for NASA. And uh, Jim Gates, pictured in the lower left, is president of the APS. Having recently concluded service as MIT senior diversity officer, I was grateful to serve the physics community and found serving on this panel to be really a transformation experience. Uh, when I returned to MIT, I could not just return and be an ordinary physics, straight physics professor. I uh, joined the program in women's and gender studies, which I'd been loosely affiliated with uh, for a while, but I wanted to formalize my commitment there and begin teaching in the humanities. And I have happily done so now uh, for my, my second year. Uh, the team of task force found it important to establish some guiding principles at the beginning of our work as a task force. The team up report is unlike other physics reports. Uh, first, it centered the experiences of students. As a faculty member at one of the highly successful departments we visited noted, Quote, students are the greatest experts in their own experience, unquote. They told us how to increase the numbers and their messages were reinforced by the faculty and the research literature. Our report was also unusual in its heavy emphasis on social science methods and perspectives. 
Unlike most other reports about physics and society written for our professional societies, we didn't treat this as a re review article, nor did we write recommendations based solely on our own experience. We actually did original social science research, which was necessary because of the scarcity of research about African-American undergraduates in physics. Our primary data source was a student survey, as well as interviews, both of which were analyzed by experts in qualitative research and sociology. We also sought information from departments and visited several of the most successful ones. After all of that research and analysis, we identified five factors that most determined whether African-American students persisted to a physics or astronomy bachelor's degree. I'll address each of them in the next series of slides. Our findings are consistent with a wide body of research, including the new report, Thinking About Leaving Revisited, written by sociologists at University of Colorado Boulder. The first factor we identified is belonging, defined as a feeling that one is a welcomed and contributing member of a community. We were most interested in departmental belonging because clearly something was happening in physics that was different from other disciplines. It was easiest to identify belonging from its absence, which was widely, though not universally, noted by black students at predominantly white institutions. A typical description was this. The climate of the physics department is very non-inclusive of people of color. The second factor was physics identity. That may be less familiar by name to you, but it is something that nearly all successful physicists recognize when it's explained. It's having the perception and feeling that others do too, that one is a physicist or a physicist in training. To the students in the audience, this is a natural construct. I'm a physics person. We're not, a student may say. Research shows that a professional identity, specifically physics identity, is a strong predictor of persistence. The problem is that one's own perception isn't enough. Attitudes of others matter. As one student, student noted, I've had two physics professors ask me why I'm in physics. Why are you still a physics major? You're making your life difficult doing this. It's very discouraging when you hear this. Academic support is probably what most physicists would first think when asked what factors support student persistence and success. Once you belong in the classroom and once you perceive yourself as a future physicist, then you can focus on academics and on getting the academic help you need. This really does make a difference as noted by a student who said, quote, there was one teacher that really, honestly, I was going to give up on physics and she changed everything. Personal support is perhaps also obvious but the role of physics departments in providing it may not be so clear. I took this lovely image from the Facebook page of the UO Center for Multicultural Academic Excellence. It illustrates well how to overcome the isolation of black students in STEM and to acknowledge, celebrate, and support the whole student. This was a major theme in the Team Up report, and it's wonderful for you that UO has this resource. But physics faculty and staff can also make a huge difference by advocating for their students, recognizing their identities outside of physics, and knowing about campus resources to help with financial and mental health needs. If you take away nothing else from this talk, let it be this. You can make a huge difference in a student's life by acknowledging them as a unique person with talents, dreams, and enormous potential and value. Remember the teacher about whom the student said that really, honestly, I was going to give up on physics and she changed everything. Leadership and structures are what organizes a department to achieve its mission. In the context of team up, they refer to establishing environments, policies, practices, and accountability for student success. I want to give a big shout out to your department for the work done by the Women in Physics Group, the Diversity Committee, and the North Star Project. Think how much greater impact you could have if more of you were involved in such efforts. This slide organizes all the findings and recommendations of our report. The five factors are included as columns. A sixth column focuses on best practices for implementation through research-based change management. I don't have time to discuss most of this. It's a big report after all, and we'll focus on only a few items, namely those highlighted in red. 
the faculty role in belonging, financial support of students, and faculty preparation and training. Uh, the report contains much, much more. It's chock full of steps you can take, and I know that many of you have read it already. Each of the five factors had findings based on our research and the research literature, followed by recommendations related to those findings. For the faculty role in establishing belonging, we showed evidence that faculty interactions have a powerful effect on student retention in or departure from the major. Student sense of belonging increases with the number of faculty who get to know them as individuals and demonstrate support for their success. This finding led to the recommendation that with the encouragement and support of their chairs, department chairs, faculty should learn, practice, and improve skills that foster student belonging in their interactions with African-American undergraduates. The report offers specific ways to carry out this recommendation. The report also gives uh, background information to contextualize the findings and recommendations, such as this observation about physics culture. And it's one that I heard echoed in some of my discussions with people today. It also describes uh, to a great extent my department. There is a tension in many departments concerning the relative importance of research and education. Developing the habit of seeking student perspectives, showing interest in and concern for events and topics relevant to their culture, and providing encouragement to those who may not feel they belong requires minimal financing, yet it offers substantial benefits in terms of improved student outcomes. Actors with social power must demonstrate inclusive actions in order to increase students' sense of belonging. Those points were driven home by our visits to departments that excel in graduating African-American physics students, most of them having limited financial resources. In fact, some struggling much more than the University of Oregon, but having outstanding faculty commitment. We were moved, frankly, by the statements of faculty at one money poor but soul rich department, especially when we saw the appreciation the students had for their faculty. And you can see uh, some of the statements of the faculty here. The second area I'll highlight is uh, financial support. Our survey interviews and site visits showed that financial stress is particularly high for many African American students given the documented enormous racial wealth disparities in the US. Colleges and universities improve student retention and graduation by providing emergency support. Although departments may not have money for students, they have knowledge and connections that benefit students. We found that effective departments should uh, share campus resources for emergency financial aid, conference travel, and other unmet needs and help students to take advantage of them. I mentioned the documented enormous racial and wealth disparities in the US. Here's a recent graph from the US Federal Reserve, our national bank. Net worth includes home equity and 401k and other retirement accounts. The racial gap is astonishing and disturbing. Sometimes some of us look around the room and conclude that because everyone here made it here and looks fine, everything is fine. That logical fallacy is not avoided by our construction of stories as to why some groups are underrepresented in physics. Who becomes a physicist is a matter of culture, not physics. Well, except physics really is part of our culture and the practice of physics is highly shaped by culture. The integrity of our profession requires that we seek the real reasons for inequitable outcomes and not whitewash them with a dominant narrative. Estella Bensimone of USC has pioneered this approach to equity in education. Equity-minded inquiry means disaggregating data by race, gender, and any other factors that account for differences in outcomes, and then acting to remedy the problems. The data in this graph, by the way, are all pre-pandemic. The pandemic has further marginalized black and brown Americans, and of course women. It was stunning to hear the last uh, jobs report uh, last week showing that uh, I think 140,000 jobs were lost in the last month. And that net job loss was 100% women. The men actually gained in employment. This is just stunning. So the pandemic is having an impact on society that will be shocking to see when the Federal Reserve data are updated. And we should look at them through an intersectional lens.
Some might feel that it's beyond the role of the university to deal with such big problems, but Tima found that the most successful departments find ways. At several schools we visited, physics faculty who learned about student financial stress were able to obtain emergency funding to assist those in need. Organizational culture is sometimes described as the way we do things around here. We can choose to do things differently, but changing the culture is hard when people don't understand why they should change or how to be effective. For that reason, the team up report devotes a full chapter to this topic and makes recommendations, its recommendations, the highest priority of them of all. Among them, the professional society should empower and prepare change agents by establishing and participating in faculty networks, learning communities, and skill building workshops, including organizing sessions at their annual meetings to discuss this and related reports. The AIP, APS, AAS, and AAAS are all engaged deeply in such efforts at this time. I'm very, very happy with that. Change starts with asking hard questions. Where are we, really? What do we want to change and why? Data tell a story, but it's also important to realize that your stories are data. The team up report provides a self-assessment rubric that will help you find these stories. It's important to have input, not just from faculty, but from students and staff and from people with varying power in the organization. Chances are good that different people will score the department differently. Is everyone safe to have their voice heard? That's important data too. And we cannot assume that everyone of the same race or gender feels the same way. How do we assemble an honest self-assessment? It starts with having important but difficult conversations about what your department values and where it seeks to go. If enough of you are dedicated to making change to improve the success of all students, I can provide some suggestions. Earlier, I mentioned the work of Estella Ben-Simone of USC. Her Center for Urban Education, which is now part of the USC Race and Equity Center led by Sean Harper, has done amazing work with math faculty that I highly recommend as I believe it's easily applicable to physics. The concept of equity mindedness is much more than fairness. Dr. Ben Simone emphasizes the need to be race conscious in a way that focuses on past experiences and future success of black, Latinx, Native American and Asian, and Asian American students. Second, avoid blaming the student or focusing on what's wrong with them. Identify and build their strengths. Third, be intentionally anti-racist to benefit minoritized students. Doing these things requires many of us to unlearn things we didn't even know we believed. We can learn from others who've undertaken this journey. For example, the math professor who said, what I've learned through this work is that I am capable of taking a stand. If I don't say anything, if I don't interject this idea of race and ethnicity into these conversations, it's not going to come up. And if it doesn't come up, then these structural inequities that occur are not going to be addressed and it will continue. What's needed is a shift in mindset. I found this wonderful quote from the Gallup organization known mainly for their survey research, but they also have wisdom about institutions like higher education. When it comes to education, they say, the big picture is really determined by the little picture, what's best for each individual student. If you wanna make an impact in education, there's no better way than one student at a time. And that's an important overall takeaway message. When the work seems overwhelming, we can find joy in individual students' success. I try to do that every day. I've covered a lot of ground, so it's uh, about time for me to zoom out. In this talk, I've shared quantitative data on degree outcomes for your department and university and for mine. I've summarized the reasons why African-Americans have not thrived in undergraduate physics programs and what to do to correct this. Bringing in the research from social sciences, we emphasize the role of stories. And as physicists, we use data to tell stories. We learned that the issues are multi-level and complex involving individuals, departments, universities, the physics profession and society at large. We found that the most important factors in black student success are belonging, professional identity, academic support, professional support, personal support and leadership and structures. 
And we learned about some programs and tools that can support our progress at the department level where faculty have the most agency. And finally, these links will bring you to the resources I, I mentioned and to others. And uh, reference number eight there was my uh, fun and provocative reading of the day, a blog entry from uh, a wonderful activist, a uh, friend of mine, uh, Rinku Sen. And I'll be providing uh, the full deck for, um, uh, for your department to retain so you can actually get all of, all of those links. And I'm going to uh, stop now, but not before I take a look at the Slido. Ah, so I see people have not answered my question. I'm gonna give you an opportunity to uh, put in something that you might've read. If it's not today, it could have been in the last few days. And uh, the other thing I'm gonna do is um, open up to questions, um, which I'm, I'm sure we'll be taking um, via raised hands and so forth. But if you want to ask a question anonymously, you can do it at the Slido link I've just posted in the chat. And with that, I thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take your questions. All right. Um, thanks, Ed. Let's all unmute who, who people want to and uh, give a round of applause for Ed for his wonderful talk. And um, yeah, if, if people can raise hands or um, if they're ready uh, with a question, they can just go ahead and ask Ed. I, I can, I can start, um, Ed. So, um, in terms of you know, so there are these upcoming team up workshops, um, implementation workshops that um, we won't be able, to, uh, we applied to but didn't get in. So, uh, what do you think are some of the best practices of of how to implement um, some of these changes and? get yeah, buy-in throughout the department, et cetera, these kinds of things. Thank you, Spencer. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry that the, that the team up implementation workshops weren't able to accommodate University of Oregon. Um, this is a, an extension of the team up project. It's uh, led by um, others, by uh, Dara Norman of uh, an, an optical astronomer, the National Opti Optical and Infrared Astronomy Laboratories and by uh, Thomas Searles, a professor at, at Howard University. And we were just a bit overwhelmed with the uh, high demand among departments. Um, I don't know whether, the, uh, whether this group, whether the workshop group will share its uh, curricular materials broadly, but I'm happy to do so uh, with, with you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a couple of things that I can, I can encourage are, one is to, to form a committee or a group to uh, have discussions. You've already done that. You've been doing that for, for a while now with your diversity committee, uh, thinking about the team up report. Um, and uh, another thing is to utilize the self-assessment rubric, uh, which I, I gather you're, you're doing or, or perhaps done. Um, and that can help to organize uh, next steps. But uh, separately or later, I'll be happy to, to talk with, uh, uh, with you, Spencer, or with your diversity committee about um, additional steps that, that you can take. I, I do want to say that um, you have to think uh, pretty deeply about what your, what your goals are and to realize that the recommendations of the team up report alone will not be enough to increase African-American undergraduates at UO just because uh, the pool that you're recruiting from is very small. So you, you, if, you, if that's your goal, you have to also add uh, thoughts about um, ex, you know, expanding outreach and, and recruitment efforts, mm -hmm. uh, which you can do. We, we've seen that uh, have some success at, at other institutions. Um, but I would add that uh, the team up recommendations, although they're, they're framed for a particular uh, research question, which was, how do you increase the number of African-American graduates in physics? Um, a lot of the research literature suggests that these are very effective practices for supporting students of, of all identities, but most particularly those that are underrepresented in your department. And so it definitely goes beyond African-American students. And, and I think if you, if you set your goals and think about assessment um, towards those goals, then you can have a, a very successful outcome with time. 
All right. Um, I have uh, Tian Tian uh, wants to ask a question, so go ahead. Yeah, so I couldn't find the, the Ray can. So thank you for the, the nice talk, Ed. Um, so one thing that is coming up is all these actions that as a department you can take. Do you have suggestions for how to get buy-in from, from various groups that it requires people to part participate? Um, and that seems to be a potential barrier is because it requires time, right? It requires time and effort and thought to, to do these activities. So how do you um, convince people who already feel very stretched thin that this is uh, this is worth their, their time? Yeah, thank you, Tian Tian. That's a very important question because frankly, all of us uh, probably feel stretched thin at, at this time. <laughs> I've, so another thing I did earlier today was I, I did a 20 minute workout, you know, online workout from, from one of those organizations. I won't advertise them here, uh, but uh, one, one of the companies that has these, uh, you know, video on demand uh, uh, um, workouts. And uh, the, the trainer um, asked a very good question. What's on your not to do list? And, and I love that because uh, we often internalize the pressure to do more. And I think it can be very fun and liberating and healthy to flip the script and ask, uh, how can we do less? Now, that doesn't mean doing less for the things we love, the people we love, the things we care about, uh, our students, issues of equity, inclusion, and so on. Um, but it, it does mean as, as you point out that uh, the burden cannot be borne by um, those who are uh, stretched the most thin. And very oftentimes that is the very minoritized group members who feel so passionately about this. So the, the broad question of how you increase the engagement and buy-in uh, within a department, that is a very big theme within a, a different project I'm involved in called APS IDEA or the Inclusion, Diversity and Equity Alliance. This is a, a national project supported by the American Physical Society now in its second year. And um, I, I'm sorry to say that the University of Oregon is, is, is not part of APS IDEA, at least not yet. Um, we, like AIP, like TeamUp, uh, were swamped uh, with the number of uh, applicants that we had, uh, but we ultimately accepted for our, our first year and now we're starting our second year. Um, 99 teams, we have 1,400 physicists, so it's a non-negligible portion of the entire physics community. And that's by design. Uh, we want to have uh, impact that, uh, that will be large, that will uh, really affect the culture of the, of the field as a whole. We're spending a lot of time with our, time with our teams uh, brainstorming on, on this issue of, of how to get buy-in, of thinking about um, the way people learn and organizations learn. So this brings in ideas from the social sciences, from organizational learning, um, cognitive sciences, neuroscience. Um, yeah, thanks to everyone who's, who's stuck with this. Um, you'll have hopefully the recording to see if anything else comes up of interest in the questions. Um, and what I can say is that we've, we're trying something. There's, there's no, there's no, um, standard model of organizations and people that a physicist would recognize as having the rigor of the standard model of physics. Having said that, there is a, a rigorous discipline of sociology and of organizational and social psychology um, that has learned a lot about these issues and that's what we're, what we're mining. Um, so we, what we found and we're trying to implement in this um, APS IDEA project is to have teams, change teams that are broadly representative like yours, where we um, kind of upset the prevailing culture by sharing leadership across those teams. So the principle of shared leadership is important for APS IDEA. That means that the undergraduates don't just listen, they lead, they, they get to co-chair meetings, they get to set the agenda along with everyone else, not just undergraduates, everyone, staff, faculty, graduate students, uh, postdocs, and, and the faculty are the minority voice, uh, or, or should be. And they have a lot of power and they should not be dominating those conversations. Um, 
our philosophy is that uh, those who are most affected by change need to be setting that change. Um, that's, that's motivated by our guiding principle of uh, uh, focusing on the uh, minoritized uh, groups and perspectives. So that's one. Another is uh, the notion that people will not agree to changes that they can't understand or that just don't make sense to them given their experience and their perspectives. So you do have to engage in sometimes difficult conversations um, and commit to um, trying to work across differences. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody in the department has to be on board, not at all. But what it does mean is that in, in practice, it really helps to have a supportive department chair, and I believe you do, um, and to have the engagement of uh, both bottom-up and top-down um, potential for action. And you ask, what, what power do people at the bottom have? Well, I'm a longtime activist and organizer, so I can tell you people at the bottom can uh, do have some power in the collective efforts. And uh, effective change um, goes with the flow. And in that sense of not trying to create oppositions, but um, recognizing the power present in the individuals in the organization. And this does require some shifting of mindsets. And, and that was something I referred to uh, in my talk. I noticed that there are a couple of questions um, in the, uh, the Q&A, so I'm gonna turn it to Spencer to decide to kind of direct the, the questions amongst, you know, raised hands, questions in the, in the Slido and so forth. Okay. Um, well, I haven't been following the Slido uh, in terms of the questions. Um, while I'm, I'm parsing this, sorry, um, since Jennifer has raised her hand in Zoom, can you go ahead while I figure out the... Look at that. Thanks, I didn't have trouble with my volume. Is it okay? It's, it's good. good. All right, thanks, sorry. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I know you didn't have much time to address more than faculty involvement, um, but I wanted to ask about students and pretty naturally forming student cohorts. Um, to say you know where I'm coming from, I'm also from MIT and I was a resident at the now defunct senior house, um, which was, or everyone else, among other things, it was a hotspot for minorities. And on one hand, I know that formed a support system that a lot of students, including myself, relied on. But on the other hand, it created a very real barrier between residents of the house and the whole of East Campus, I guess, and the rest of the MIT community. And I wanted to ask how you would suggest the encouraging, I guess, natural um, community building without creating those kind of barriers. Well, thank you so much for the question. Um, I disagreed with the MIT administration's handling of senior house. Um, I felt it was uh, um, particularly their understanding of, of the needs and experiences of marginalized group members, particularly sexual and gender minorities, I found very disturbing. Um, so, I, so I understand where, the, where your, your question is, is coming from. Um, I can say that the kind of data I showed you on uh, graduations, uh, degrees awarded, I've looked at for hundreds of, of colleges and universities. And, and for some, I'm trying to do really in-depth studying to understand uh, for some departments what exactly is happening in the department. I'm not yet at the stage of, of interviews, but uh, one thing I, I plan to do for some departments at MIT is actually interview alumni to uh, learn specifically about their experiences and, and to try and um, uh, see how those correlate with uh, patterns in graduation data. Uh, but one thing does seem pretty clear uh, for, uh, for many minoritized groups, you, you will see kind of oscillations in the, in the percentages and some of that is present in the EULA data as, as well. And I, I call this cohort clumping. Um, it's really hard for, for one student who is different along some identity dimension to uh, persist. But if there's a cluster of such students, then their persistent rates, I believe, are higher. Um, and uh, so I think that actually shows up in, in the data. And therefore, it does suggest that one should try to create um, spaces for students to um, be themselves, to thrive, uh, to support one another, 
even if the prevailing culture of a department doesn't do that. Um, this is actually well known in uh, African American studies. They're called counter spaces. Um, and these can be so, anything like a student club, you know, Nesby chapter, National Society of Black Engineers, or National Society of Black Physicists um, a chapter. Uh, you know, it could, it could be a, an LGBT uh, a Q organization on campus um, or a national organization that, that students or, or others are part of that kind of re that gives support of salient identity elements when the dominant culture is hostile. And uh, what a lot of us uh, struggle to learn is that we may not think we're being hostile, we may not intend to be hostile, but what matters is our impact. And the MIT experience with Senior House shows that um, there is a gulf between uh, intent and, and impact. So uh, thank you very much for that question. Thank you. All right. Um, so I'll, maybe I'll read some of the questions from the Slido. Um, so the first question is, um, what can we learn from the high representation of a Asian Americans? And are there experiences and feelings of inclusion that we can draw on? That's a that's a good question. It's a it's a complicated one, um, and I'm not expert in it, so I, I don't want to say too much, except that um, I, I think a real answer to that can only come from hearing the perspectives, the multiplicity of perspectives of, of Asian Americans, and uh, I also want to say that um, numbers and representation at the bachelor's degree level doesn't automatically translate into representation and respect in other settings. So for example, the fraction of faculty who are Asian American uh, in STEM disciplines is much less, I don't have the figures at the top of my head, but it's much less than the fraction who, uh, who graduate in, in physics, uh, for example. Um, so one has, to, the, the questions are multifaceted and if one wanted to answer that question faithfully, I, I would kind of recommend the methodology that team up or that sociologists in general take, which is to be, to hear the experiences of, of those uh, in that group. Um, and the next question is uh, in terms of this roadblock, roadblock that you brought up of the number of underrepresented students who apply to you and are in the population is very low. Um, are there any thoughts on how the department can do to bridge this gap? Yeah, I, I mentioned that, um, well, probably apparent that UO uh, is constrained by the resident population of, of Oregon and, and Oregon um, has uh, certainly very few uh, African Americans, um, although not, it's not zero, obviously. It's, uh, I think I've forgotten three percent if I remember the representation of the state, but um, that's. It turns out that half of the University of Oregon's entering first year class comes from outside of Oregon. So it might be worth uh, talking with your college admissions people and finding out, you know, what are they doing for admissions. Um, I can tell you that uh, in 1968, 69. Uh, when, you know, after Martin Luther King was assassinated, uh, all around the country, students started organizing, particularly black students saying, we demand um, representation, we demand um, black faculty, we demand uh, efforts to recruit black students. And at MIT, the students joined with the admissions office and went on college recruiting tours. And they, they went from something like three or four students in the freshman class to almost 100 students in the freshman class in one year because they joined forces with the, the admissions office realized that they had better work with the students and they were quite effective in uh, in recruiting. Now again, um, I can't say that that same level of success would be accessible to, to Oregon for a whole variety of factors, not least of which is the uh, inequitable uh, financial circumstances, but it's worth finding out what your admissions office does. And probably some of you are involved in, in outreach efforts. Um, I think that there's, you know, a lot of departments find it um, fruitful to 
work in their local communities or in uh, the cities um, and to recruit that way. All right. Are there any other questions for Ed? Okay, I haven't seen anything. So um, let's thank Ed again for uh, you know wonderful talk and all his contributions and ideas. Thanks, Ed. Thank you all so much. And um, I don't know if you can see the results from that poll that I uh, posted, but um, I see it now. There's been a lot of great entries about uh, thought-provoking readings that you have, and I will share the spreadsheet. Uh, with Spencer as well as the slides of this talk. So thank you all. Really enjoyed being with you. Thank you.